Today, though, the emphasis is on what? Lace. Acts chapter 2. Yes. We are. The plague, the locusts. So as Joel is going to say, the sun and the moon are darkened, do we have an understanding of what that means? That means there are so many of these little rascals, you can't see daylight as they pass by, as they're going through the land. Now, imagine the whole area that you lived in became dark with these flying pests. What would it be like? Yeah, be miserable, scary, tr trembling. All of this comes to mind because this is what God is doing. And he's doing it on purpose. He's not doing it by accident. This is the word of God telling us what he is up to and why he is up to it. All right, so Proverbs. We trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing to your body, a refreshment to your bones. Is this what God wanted Israel to do at the moment? Yes, he wanted them to turn back. He really wanted them to turn back. But he couldn't get their attention. Does he have to be harsh sometimes to get our attention? Did he have to be harsh to Saul to get his attention on the road to Damascus? Yeah. yeah. He had to kick him in the head in order to get his attention, make him blind, make him understand. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. Did they loathe his reproof to some degree? They did. I think so. They did. They were angry because God was giving them curses rather than blessings. And then finally, for whom the Lord loves, he reproves. And what's the example? Father, family, yeah. Daughter. Yeah. <laughs> Father, son, mother, daughter example. Do you not correct your children? Of course you do. You do this because you love them. If you didn't love them, you wouldn't bother. And there are a lot of parents that don't bother, aren't there? All right, let's get into the text. We're beginning at verse 14. Set up a solemn occasion for godly sorrow. This was the command of the prophet from the revelation of God. If the nation had turned back to God, could God have stopped the discipline? Yes. Of course he could have, for sure. Yes. God changed his mind. Yes, he absolutely. Doing something wrong to start with, yes. But it's a change of mind. Yes. And he would like to, wouldn't he? I mean, if you're, if you're disciplining your child and they change their way because of your discipline, wouldn't you stop the discipline? Yeah, of course, you would cut it off in a minute. You would like what is happening, what is taking place. All right. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land, the leaders, to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord, alas for the day. It's a day of pity, of repentance. Hebrews chapter 5 speaks of that kind of day. For the day of the Lord is near. His wrath, his judgment, his accountability is all near. It's God asking, pleading with his people to turn back to him. And it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Amos 5.18 speaks of the same. Has not food been cut off before your eyes? How had food been cut off before their eyes? Yeah, <laughs> they didn't have any. They didn't have any plants. They didn't have anything left. It was devastating. They just mowed it down as they went across the, the land. And it, they didn't... Do locusts get full and decide to stop no. and go to bed? No, they just keep going and going and going. They just devour and devour and devour. They never stop. All right. Yeah, no, you couldn't. You had a locust in it. Yes, yeah. You, in every ear, mouth, all of, eyes, these things were everywhere. You couldn't stop them. You couldn't imagine trying to live with them. Gladness and joy from the house of our Lord. 
Does God want to give loudness and joy? Yes. He, but, he, but he can't because they won't what? They won't, accept it. they won't accept it. They won't turn from their evil ways. God, when you wear his name, do you wear more responsibility than those that do not? Yes. Of course you do because you represent him. And in representing him, people look at you and they wonder what kind of people are of God. And if you're not looking like the people of God, you're not the representation God desires. God wants from you. The seeds shrivel under the clouds. The storehouses are desolate. The barns are torn down for the grain is dried up. All of this is part of what? Discipline. This is part of God trying to turn his people back. Jonah was more righteous than the Israelites. Stop to think about that. Now Jonah, the Ninevites, I should have said, was more, were more righteous or noble than the Israelites. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Why didn't he want to go to Nineveh? Yeah, they didn't. He looked down on those people. They were Gentiles. They're not God's people. Why would you go to them, God? You're our God. That's Jonah's attitude. He yeah, he was prejudiced against them. And yet, they were more noble than these Israelites of Joel's day. Because what did Jonah do? The people of Jonah believed in God. They repented by faith and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Jonah, the leader, he arose from his throne. He laid aside his robe from him. He covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes or on, on ashes. What, what does that mean? What is that a representation of? He was sad and he was sorrowful for all the things that he had done wrong. A godly sorrow that Paul talks about in uh, 2 Corinthians, yes. This is a godly sorrow that you humble yourself and you accept that you've sinned and you need to change and you're going to give your what to God your heart to God absolutely you're going to give your heart to God he issued a proclamation to the whole nation he said in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles do not let men beast herd or flock taste a thing what was he doing fasting a way to show God their repentance in flesh do not let them eat or drink to fast to make the flesh uncomfortable, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. Was that an uncomfortable thing to be covered in? Yeah, itchy. Yeah, very itchy, very uncomfortable. Why is that physical act of not eating, not drinking, and being covered in sackcloth, why is that physical act acceptable to God? Okay, and first, and then I'll come over there. Physically, the act of fasting allows your body to cleanse its needs. Ah, it actually has an effect on yes. you, doesn't it? Yes. yes, Maria. It's a form of sacrifice. It is a form of sacrifice, absolutely. It's a form of humility and sacrifice. Joe. Well, I, I understand the man in that cloth, but what about the beast? Yes, okay, why would they include the beast? They don't know. <laughs> God's concept of living things on earth. Who, ha who is Lord over the beast? No, man is. And so if God is Lord over man and he's willing to repent, is man willing to take it as Lord to others? He is, even to his animals to this degree. So it's kind of that whole concept of Romans chapter 8 when it talks about the whole creation was affected by the sin of man. Well, the whole creation needs to put, be in submission to God in its repentance. And so he included the beast in this. Now, is the beast going to understand this? No, he's not going to understand it. Does man understand it, though? Yes, he does. As Lord, he understands he needs to lord over whatever he is lord over to get them, mainly his children, his family, as the patriarch of the family, to get them to understand what? We've sinned against God. And God is Lord of everything. And we need to repent of such. 
the uncomfortableness of repentance. Yes? In my, in my feeble brain, I'm yes? seeing all of this action, mm-hmm. acting like when your computer gets all locked up, you need to do a reset. Yes. Control, alt, delete, power off, power back on. That's a huge reset. It's a total reboot of your life. Jonah was, or Nineveh was willing to do this. Why was Israel so stubborn and unwilling to do this? Focused on self rather than God. Self, self rather than God, yes. They were thinking they were all that because they were God's chosen. Ah. And rather than seeing, they were acting like the stereotypical privileged rich kid. Yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely, Phoebe. Overconfidence, yeah, that's a good word for it. No matter what I do, I'm not going to get in trouble because we're the chosen. We're the chosen people of God. Instead of recognizing that meant they had a greater responsibility, not less. Yes. Boy, that and gets home because that's us. It is us to some we're degree, all isn't it? Chosen people now. Yes. yes. When we jump on the pedestal or the pulpit and we begin to get on our high horse about sin, and we don't admit or acknowledge that we are a sinner just like everyone else, Maybe what are we more, doing? We should, we should know better. We should know better, yes. The people of God are a representative of who God is and what God has given in what we call the gospel. And if the people of God don't teach the gospel, which is grace and mercy for sinners, then who's going to teach it? No, no one is. So when we get to some degree, any degree at all, really, of a high horse, uh, of, of championing ourselves in name only, then we are in trouble, just like Israel was in trouble. And uh, I, I think even Judah and Benjamin looked to the ten, norths to, ten tribes to the north and put them down to a degree because they no longer came to Jerusalem to worship God. But we still do. And yet they will follow in the same footsteps eventually, yes? But, right? Yeah, I, I think because of the way that the Israelites were, were acting, when we look at that behavior, we need to re, uh, you know, take it into our own self and say, hey, we don't want to be like that. So use it as an example of not what we want to do. How do you keep yourself humble before the Lord? God, yourself, what? Compare yourself to God. Comparisons? All right. Remember what did, the Israelites. Okay. Remember this. Study these things. Understand what they really mean. Absolutely. And what are the... Go ahead. Well, one of the things that stands out to me so strong when reading through the Exodus is, you know, on one hand, you shake your head and go, oh, what are they thinking? Yes. And realizing we're not any different. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. When Paul says, as we partake of these two emblems in communion with one another, and he says, examine yourselves during that period of time, what does he want you to do? Yes, he wants you to look and to to take a deep dive into your own mental heart and ask yourselves, why am I doing this? And what do I do when I'm not here? What do I do in the rest of the week? Who am I really? If God had to come today and give a list of what I'm doing during my life, is it going to be a good list or a bad list? Maybe we ought to make the list so we can tell whether it's a good list or a bad list. Yes? Like the parable of the Pharisee and the sinner. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, God. I'm not like this sinner over here. And he only had what in his heart? Humility, you know? Bowing his head, unwilling to look toward God and, help, and pleading with God for help. If we don't recognize the need, the overwhelming need we have for Jesus Christ, we're never going to accept the fact that we are sinners. We have to have the blood of Jesus Christ to even present ourselves before God someday. And without it, we are in trouble. Let's finish this. But both men and beasts will be covered with sackcloth. Let the man call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which he has in his hands. Who knows? Who knows? God may what? He may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger. 
They already knew they were under the discipline of God. They already knew danger was at their doorstep. Who did God warn that sin was at the door, and if you want to do good, Cain. Yes, he told Cain directly, look, sin is knocking at your door. What are you going to do about it? What did Cain do? He opened the door. He just opened the door and said, come on in, and he killed his brother. He wanted to do evil rather than good. All right, so when, saw, when God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked way, then God relented. He relented. Will he do that with Israel, his own people? Of course he would have. Concerning the calamity which he had declared, he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So this is where God wants us to go. He had relented multiple times with Before. Israel. Yes, he had. What happens, though? We have to remember these things took place over hundreds of years. What happens to one generation to the next generation? We forget. Yeah, we forget. We don't teach. We don't follow. We don't take it to heart. We're living in a generation, in my opinion, that is, going, that is headed downhill, not uphill, when it comes to worshiping God. A lot of us have seen our children, our grandchildren, turn away from God. The influences of Satan and the things that have come about in, I don't know, the teaching of evolution and the concepts of, of men that are wiser than this foolishness that's found in this book, all of those things are overwhelming our children. They did the same to Israel. They overwhelmed their children. And their children became like the nations around them. And unfortunately, God will discipline for them. Are there still today destroying, are there some still today destroying God's world? Absolutely, yes. yes. How are they doing it? Perversion. Perversion? All right. Is it by climate change or sin? I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> are we destroying the world by climate change or sin? Yeah. <laughs> sin, of course. God controls the world. He controls what happens to it. He controls how long it will last. He controls the temperature of it, as far as I'm concerned, right down to the minute temperature of it. Man's sin influences God's control of the world, does it not? It does. Has God used earthquakes in the past for discipline? Does he use weather in the past for discipline? Does he use insects in the past for discipline? Okay, if you know all of these things and they come upon a nation, what should a nation do like Nineveh did? Wake up and repent. Exactly. Israel needs to do, of course, the same thing. How the beasts groan, Joel says. Now again, here's the beasts. What, how would the beasts groan about the sin of man? Literally. Because it affects them as well. Ah! Would you see a growing beast who had nothing to eat and no water to drink? Of course, if God stops the rain, will the beast groan? If God sends locusts to eat all the food, will the beast groan? Of course, the animals are going to be affected by this. We sing a song about the deer panting after what? Water. For the water. They need water. They know they need water. It's built within them. They need food. They know they need food. It's built within them. When God disciplines man and takes it away, does the beast suffer? Yeah. Of course the beasts suffer. They will groan as well. The herds of the cattle wander aimlessly. What are they wandering after? Food. food. They're looking for grass. They're trying to figure out where to go to eat because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of the sheep suffer. Now, a sheep can eat just about anything. If you ever had a sheep, you know they'll eat it right down to the dirt, and some of them will eat the dirt. It's pretty amazing getting the roots out of the ground. But a cow won't do that. A cow has to have the lush green stuff on top in order to, to eat what it needs to eat. So it's even worse all the way down to the sheep. Yes? We have a small flock of sheep. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then Steve comes with the bales of alfalfa and yeah. they finally Whoa. get full and lay down. Yes, absolutely. Yes. 
These, these are just natural things within them. Yes, Anne. Yes. 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 Actually, your brain is right on track because God gave Israel 400 years of silence, no bread and water, just past history, and asked them to survive on that until he released the Holy Spirit to overwhelm them with springs of water which is the Spirit telling them exactly what God needed them to do and how they could have salvation in God. So feeding the Spirit is greater than feeding the flesh, and yet the vast majority of the world rejects the food and water of the Spirit. Whether they reject it or not, we need to accept it and yes. get in the Word. Absolutely. You know, just if we do that ourselves and have influence on the people around us, the trickle effect will work. Yes, it's part of examining ourselves, isn't it? Knowing God's word. How do you examine yourself against a standard if you don't know the standard? His word is the standard, and therefore we need to lay ourselves down beside the standard and see how we line up, see how we match up. Okay, so the herds of the cattle, they, went, they wander aimlessly because there is no pasture, even the sheep. To you, O Lord, I cry. And if you, you can read three Psalms, 46, 47, and 48. This is a cry to God for this very purpose. What do you cry to God for? What you, need. what you need. Help. You cry to God for help. God wants you to wake up to the need of Him. If you decided you have no need for Him anymore, then what happens to you? You will die spiritually. He will abandon you. He will discipline you. And if you don't accept his discipline, he will give up on you. He will actually not worry about you anymore. He'll go after somebody else. I begin to think maybe this nation is close to that. When I, uh, you re read reports about uh, underground congregations throughout China and Bibles being smuggled in because they have been uh, um, banned by the government, and you start to see that sometimes the evil of man helps create the desire of God in the Spirit. And people start to pant after the water that uh, they need in Spirit. All right. For fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Now, why did he jump from locust to fire here? I think there's two reasons, but what? They will devour. Fire devours. What's left when a fire gets done? Nothing. What's left when these locusts are going to get done? Nothing. How did you fight the locust? With fire. You started backfires. If they're all coming from the south and they're eating every field, what do you do? You burn everything in front of them for a mile or two and you stop them or divert them or slow them down so that you can do something. So fire became to the Israelites during this time, a preventative, a weapon. But did you have anything left after the fire? <laughs> You still had the devastation of no food. Yes. But after a fire, the, the earth will come back. Yes. The grass will come back. You're helping the ground, actually. Yes. yes. Yeah. And so there is hope after a fire. After the locusts, there's not a lot of hope. No, there's nothing left. Yes. So, yes, they did defeat the locusts or fight the locusts with fire. All right. So, uh, where am I? He's devoured the pastures of the wilderness. The flame has burned up all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you like the deer. For the water brooks are dried up and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Even the wilderness has been taken away from you. Where do a lot of cattlemen and sheep, where do they actually pasture their animals? In the wild or the wilderness, yeah. And there's enough for them to travel around to find food. Unfortunately, the wilderness is even going to be affected by this to this degree. All right, let's start chapter 2. Chapter 2 is where the prophecy or types are located in Joel. And they're located, which Peter uses in Acts chapter 2. And these, he quotes Joel directly and applies it to whom? 
to Israel and Jesus. Yes. Peter and the other 11. Yes, thank you. Always correct me. I like these things. <laughs> Peter and the other 11, because we have Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. The other 11 were doing the same thing, probably in a different language, all around the temple. All right. So, the devastation of such a discipline of God's wrath, will it wake Israel up? Okay, yes and no. For a period of time, they will have some good kings, won't they? Judah and, ben and Benjamin. But unfortunately, the nation as a whole, it ends up being so bad that God takes them away where? Into Babylonian captivity. And is the type, is the locust a type and shadow of the Babylonian army? Yes. It is, absolutely is. And therefore, they needed to understand what was coming at them. Blow a trumpet in Zion. What was a trumpet blown for? Alert. Alert. Yes, war. There's a war coming. Could you fight back 10 million locusts? I just made that number up. I have no idea how many there were. There were a devastating amount on the land, so it may have been more than 10 million. But could you fight it, actually? No. Why couldn't you actually fight it? God was behind it. That's why you couldn't fight it. it, it were there more locusts to come? Yes. He, he actually previously talked about four different waves of locusts that would come. And those waves all came from God. God sent them. Can you fight against God? No. You'll never win. You can't fight against the power of God. Blow a trumpet. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Where is his holy mountain? It's Zion. But in a metaphoric way, I think he's talking about his people, Israel. Yes, it is Zion where he placed his name. But it's the nation. That's his holy mountain on the face of the earth. That's the people who are supposed to be holding up his name. That's who everybody looks to and says, he's the God of Israel. Well, if Israel doesn't look like a decent people, then he's the God of an indecent people, isn't he? That's his name. That's what his name would be represented by. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Does God actually want us to tremble at his name? Yes, fear, reverent respect, and trembling. Who God is, and his power, and his greatness, and who we are to him. These things are important for us never to forget. When we raise ourselves higher, when we get too big for our britches, as my mom used to say, we are, setting God, are bringing God down and setting ourselves up, aren't we? Yes, we do that. Can we do that? Pride. Does that to us, doesn't it? Tremble. Why? Because of their sin, and here comes the wrath of God. For the day of the Lord is coming. Is this the final judgment? The day of the Lord is coming? This might be for them. But yeah. <laughs> it could be for each one of them, absolutely. There are many days of the Lord throughout the scriptures. They almost always have a specific but they are meant to teach a lesson of the generic. When a day of the Lord comes, who is in trouble? Yeah. We are, yes. Because it's going to be a horrible day in the sense that if we're not right with God, we're going to see the fierce wrath of God. And is wrath or love better? Not a choice. Yes, it's not a choice, is it? The love of God is what we want. Surely it is near. What does it mean that something is near? Well, that it's coming soon. Yeah, it's coming soon. It's not far off. It's going to happen. Joel is making it clear. Now, is Joel talking about the locust that is near, or is he talking about Babylon that is near? Yes. Probably Babylon, because he talks about the locust in the past tense sometimes. And as he talks about it in the past tense, he's trying to get them to understand this ugliness that you witnessed and are telling your grandsons and your great-grandsons, your great-grandsons about it, that ugliness is just a representation of what's coming down the line that's worse. Now, would there be anything worse coming down the line than the destruction of Babylon? The judgment of God. 
That's exactly right. The judgment of God for eternity is much worse than the judgment of Babylon, isn't it? Of course it was. Somebody have a question? I saw a hand. No? Okay. All right. So, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it before. What did it look like if you were in Jerusalem and on the wall and Nebuchadnezzar came with his thousands upon thousands upon thousands of troops and they surrounded the high places of Jerusalem? What did it look like? Yeah. Yeah. The end of the world. Because you knew, even though the wall was there and you could fight against him for a period of time, what did Nebuchadnezzar know? He would win eventually through siege. What does it mean to siege a city? Yeah, stop all supply to the city and wait 30 to 60 days. And what happens? 85% of the people are already dead in the city from starvation, and the rest of them can't lift a sword. And now you just walk right in. Now, you could pile up a lot of goods in a big city like Jerusalem and last a while, but not forever. It's just a while, and it's not going to work. Hezekiah actually built a tunnel for the water to come down, but who else did that? Nebuchadnezzar did that in Babylon. And what did the Medo-Persians do? They built a dam, (laughs) and when the water stopped, they went under the tunnel into the city. So you have no way to protect yourself if the power of God has decided that you are going to fall. There is no way to protect yourself from the power of God. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. What's he trying to say? He's trying to say this is going to be a really big deal. Really big. Really big. Who used to say that? Ed Sullivan, I think. Really big. It's a really big deal. It's going to be bigger than you can imagine. And it's going to be fiercer than you can imagine. A fire consumes before them. And behind them, a fire burns. Back to the locust. If a fire consumes before them, you're trying to stop them. But what's behind them? The same consumption of a fire. Nothing. So you're going to end up with what? Nothing. Nothing. Because they're going to get it all. Because God has decided they're going to get it all. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. That's the blessings of God. But a desolate wilderness behind them. Nothing at all escapes them. What do you... Yes, Debbie. What about the remnant? Yes. Yes. I mean, because there were some. Yes. Yes. What about them? What about them? Do they get, do they go through this? Yes. They go through this. They have to go through this. And is it fair that they go through this? No. It's not fair at all in our concept of fairness, is it? Because we look at it and say, God, I I was hanging on. What do you, why do I have to go through this? And yet... What should the mindset be of the remnant? God is with us. Pray. We should join God in discipline. Can we stop the evil? Can we vote enough politicians in, in our minority, to stop the evil of a nation? No, we cannot. It's not possible. Can God do it through discipline? Can we thank God for his discipline? Even though it affects us, even though we're going to suffer? Yeah, Daniel. Yes, yes. And does God know those that are his, the remnant? He knows them. But they all suffered. But they all suffered. And is suffering in death the worst thing that can happen to the remnant? No. No, it's the best thing that can happen to the remnant because where do you go after that? You go to God. And he takes care of you. And you have the pleasantness of eternal life with God. 
We don't want to leave this world. We're all afraid of death. I don't care who you are, you fear death. It's appointed and a man wants to die. This is the fear that we have of death. But if we can raise our spirits to understand that God is in control, and even during his discipline and hardship, we can be with him. We can, cha we can champion him for what he's doing in destroying evil, then we will have the understanding of God is with us. But it doesn't feel like it in the flesh, does it? It never will. Yes, Ann. Yes, they were. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and Babylon did all these horrible things, which is an opportunity for you to grow. So it's in the punishment, God also includes a source of nourishment and growth. A way of escape is how the Apostle Paul put it. There's a way of escape. Yes. For those who are who are challenged with God's appearance. All right, the appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses, so they run. What is this a direct reference to? Yes, they looked like horses coming across the valley and challenging them. But the horses are actually going to be from what nation? Babylon. From Babylon. And they will be like an army that will run. With a noise of chariots, they leap on tops of the mountains. Like the crackling of a flame of fire consuming the stubble. Have you ever heard thousands of locusts or grasshoppers? It is unbelievable how loud it is. It's the crackling that goes on as they're all eating at the same time. They make a noise. Absolutely they do. Yes, it's unbelievable the noise or the sound that they make. Like a mighty people arranged for battle. The people will literally be Babylon, but like a mighty people, the locusts will do the same. Before them, the people are in anguish, all faces turn pale. Scared to death? Sure. Will the remnant be scared to death? Sure. Because the body, the flesh, has all of these chemicals to release for fear and trembling. How do you control it? You don't necessarily control the flesh, but what did Jesus say? The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. What does he want us to understand there? We can get there in spirit, even though we know the flesh is weak. And if the spirit knows the flesh is weak, we will be able to understand those feelings we have in our fleshly body that are overwhelming us. And we will place our mind on God. His will, His discipline, His word, and what He wants at the moment. If we praise God for the discipline that He gives the world to turn it back to Him, is that a good thing? Yes. It is a good thing. Even though we're not going to enjoy it, it's a good thing. Tim and I were talking just earlier today about what happens to this nation if another evil nation comes and takes it over, just like... Babylon took over Israel. What happens to us? We don't know. But do we have somebody to trust in who's a greater refuge than this nation? Yes, yes we do. That's we have to make him our refuge. What? That's a certain comfort, especially when we're going through something that's bad. We know that we're in God's corner. That is the comfort that God wants from us. Uh, 1 Kings 25, here's Babylon coming. All right, the city was broken into it. All of the men of the war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls beside the king's garden. They tried to get away, though the Chaldeans were all around the city, and they went by way of the Arabah, which is the desert area. And what happened? But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered before him, and they captured the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And he passed sentence on him, the judgment of death and captivity. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, then put out the eyes of Zedekiah, made him blind, and bound him with a bronze fetters, and brought him to Babylon. They didn't just kill him. They made him suffer. 
They gave him a life sentence of blindness in a city as a captive. And they did all of this because he wouldn't turn back to God. He wouldn't turn his nation back to God. He wouldn't do the things. Here's a map of what he talks about. Jerusalem, of course, is here. They would escape down to the area of Jericho, which is in this far uh, wilderness area. And he was captured there and taken all the way up to Rib Riblah, which is north of Damascus, the Syria area. And so Nebuchadnezzar was camped at Riblah, and he sends his army to do the devastation, and he has them bring the king back to him at Riblah. What is he doing up at Riblah? He's celebrating and being safe. He's the king. He's not going to put himself in danger. He's going to be up there sitting on a throne in luxury and destroying God's people. Habakkuk couldn't understand that, could he? Yes. Yes, there are two different Jerichos. Yes. How do we reconcile, like Habakkuk, how do we reconcile God using something more evil to destroy a nation that is not all evil? His hope is to turn people back to him. Yes. Both the aggressor and the aggressive. Correct, yes. Could there have been in Babylon, people who were not evil? Yes, of course there could. By conscience sake, the Gentiles were responsible to God. And so even in Babylon, there could have been non-evil people. But what God was doing was using an arm of evil to destroy more evil, which was Israel doing evil. And he was doing so in order to turn them all back to him, in order to get their attention in order to go back to God. We're out of time. Thank you very much for your kind attention.